Hey, it's Jose Galison of No Way Jose. Uh, you can find me on the No Way Jose YouTube channel. I'm also on all the major podcatchers. I'm on Odyssey as well. Today, my guest is Caleb Brown. Uh, get, there's going to be a little bit of different format going forward. Well, maybe, I guess not so much a format, but a little bit of a change. Uh, this right now is a live stream. Uh, or If you're w- watching the 11th, it's a, it's a live stream. Uh, but the, it, what will happen is after we're done here, I'll, I'll put it on unlisted, private, whatever, and then I'll release as a numbered episode later. Uh, I'm thinking here in the future, I may stop doing these live streams as public and I may start go to like just patrons only. But with that, I lowered I lowered my tiers on Patreon uh, to my lowest being two. That way, I hopefully I can get more people because the more people in the live chat, the better, uh, the better at interaction and so on and so forth. So. Going forward, uh, here's how my Patreon is going to work. I have my my lowest tier will be two bucks, and this will get you access to the live streams, um, and it will also give you access. Like currently, right now, how it works, I do these public ones, and then I will, like I said, I release a number of episodes later. But on my Patreon, you'll have access to it in the in between as well. Um, also, you know, so that's the two dollar level. It'll give you access to all that. Then the five dollar level will give you uh, what I call chat preference, where I say essentially give you like a little code. Uh, and th- that way you can use that in the chat and I will be able to recognize like, oh, that's uh, they have chat preference and I will treat it as if it's a super chat. Uh, I've actually if I'll put it above a super chat. Uh, and that's something I currently have right now as well with my current Patreon. If you want to k- jump in on the five dollar level, uh, I have the ten dollar level, which is uh, essentially I mean, all these are stacking onto each other. If you aren't aware, uh, I feel like it's pretty clear. But uh, the ten dollar level will be like an episode. So. I basically prompt my my kind of my promise to anyone on the $10 level is I will, uh, if you get with me, uh, we will essentially let you curate an episode, whether that's, uh, and within reason. I mean, if you're being like completely insufferable and you want me to do some sort of topic that I have nothing to say about it or I absolutely hate, like, I'm sorry. But if it will essentially allow you to, you know, have get, essentially curate an episode, whether that be the topic, the guest, uh, or even yourself, um, and we'll go from there. Obviously, that'd be something we you talk to me about and we'll work it out. Uh, this is within reason. Um, so also uh, on the twenty dollar level, this is the sponsor level, and this will be essentially what this is. Is you'll I'll read you read off your shit at the beginning of every episode. Right now, I don't have a ton of on the twenty dollar level. I only have a couple, so I'm gonna read the ten dollar level as well. So until there's more twenty dollar levels, and then I'll stop reading the ten dollar levels. Um, so with that, my twenty dollar sponsors are. C.D. McRae of the Whiskey and Tea podcast, Jermaine Vincent, uh, who's a big roller in the in the podcast scene, uh, Adam, and then also at Big Bong, Big Bog, God, that fucks me up, at Big Bog Horn. Uh, that's his Twitter handle. Uh, he has the No Time to Explain podcast. Obviously, you know, if you want me to read off your your podcast, or whatever, like I'll, I'll basically this is your chance to, for me to plug your stuff, or if you have a business or whatever. Um, Today, uh, the topic we're doing is we'll be doing, we're going to keep, me and Caleb are going to be continuing our uh, live reading of An Agorist Primer uh, by Samuel Edward Conkin III, um, and this should be good. Um, hopefully, I'm hoping that, especially once it's done, more people will come to it, because it is cool that we're essentially reading it for you. I know most, a lot of people don't read these days, so this is a, essentially like a little bit better than an audiobook. We'll give you like commentary as we go. Uh, you know, as as... Obviously, with the Patreon, I mentioned the Patreon before. I didn't give you the link. Here's the Patreon now. Uh, Patreon.com slash NoWayJose2020. Uh, yeah, as always, Top Lobster's the fucking man. Uh, check his stuff out at toplobster.com. Use Jose at checkout for 10% off. Uh, with that, I'm going to bring in Caleb. What's up, dude? What up? Not much, What's man. What up? Not much. Chilling. I know you, you've been causing problems on Twitter today, apparently. I, I, didn't, I didn't. You told me, but I saw the tweet, and I was like, oh, I was probably going to cause a shit storm, and then I just kind of yeah. like didn't follow it after that <laughs> yeah so. i don't blame you i don't blame me I, I i stand by what i said i would good tweeting only because i don't like dealing with the autism oh i, I got what you're getting at like I, I get what you're getting at i i, I don't know if i know some people uh because essentially I don't, know, I don't know if you want to go deep into that but uh mm. I mean, we can if you want just for a quick, so why not? quick aside <laughs> huh why not why not Let's yeah do, you can go ahead and tell the audience so and then so, we'll, we'll move into it uh Zoswa smith who is great i respect the dude a lot um, gave Brandy Love or talked to Brandy Love about Ross Ball had anatomy to state and wanted to not only convince her but wanted someone with a million plus follower platform to come, you know, speaking about the ideas of liberty and like Ross Ball. And I objected to having this anybody speak about the ideas is a good thing. 
You know, you wouldn't want someone who's an active drug addict or a domestic abuser to speak about liberty because that's going to taint the ideals and make everyone else look bad by default. And so did, is anybody speaking about it? I think it's, harm, it's harmful. Is this a wrong idea and can do more harm than good? And if you're going you're to alienate a lot of conservatives by having someone kicked out of the conservative party for being a porn star, not speaking about our, our ideas. So he's going to look at the washed up porn star and he's going to be completely alienating the conservative right. I think it's a mistake. And because of that reason, I must uh, hate all porn stars and want them all go to hell. And oh. Stephen Cassetta is just weeing the fuck out of it. it is, Whores are my ugh. favorite, dude. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, totally joking. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I know. I could kind of see you again. This is, I, I had Stratty on, uh, on my episode uh, yesterday. Uh, I'm not sure when this will drop in the numbered episodes for people listening, but we kind of went into the whole like degeneracy stuff uh, a little bit. And, I think uh, you, you always got to be mindful, I think, with the degeneracy, you know, at side of things that like uh, it's extremely subjective. Um, yeah. So but I mean, obviously, I, I'm not I don't think I mean, I guess I wouldn't say there's anything bad with with that. But I get what you're getting at. Um, but at the same time, it's like presenting these ideas for uh, people like that. I, I can see the merit in it. I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you can especially get them to buy onto it, I mean, ideally, maybe they'll get into some of the other stuff later. Like yeah. I said, degeneracy is kind of very subjective. So, uh, I mean, really for me, that's just, I, I kind of describe it as just yeah. something that's a damaging uh, thing to propagate, which I mean, I don't know. If she was getting the like liberty type stuff, and uh, I mean, I, well, I don't I, know. it's I, very I, debatable same, with porn. I, 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 I mean, I'm, time, I'm not like a Christian fellow, so, but I yeah. can get what you're getting at. At so. the same time, though, it's like, who really cares what the uh, porn star's political views are? You skip the scenes where she's talking. Yeah, you know, it's, not, it's not like you're gonna go mid fuck, go fuck me like the state daddy. It's like we're not gonna. I I don't see the purpose in having a a porn star be the one for. Like, I I, I thought it's awesome. If you really want to convince people on porn for liberty, upload you shit to Pornhub. Yeah, put your pockets on Pornhub. I think if you really want to reach out to these people, that's the way to do it. I don't. I mean, on an individual level, I get what he's doing, but in the ripple effect he wants out of it, I I don't understand as being effective or even possible. God, who was it? Uh, I actually think it's my uh, Justin Campbell, the one who did my uh, my intro. Uh, and he's the he's the he's the man. If you have like any podcast needs, like editing, intro stuff like that, he's a good guy to hit up uh, at, at J Camp something some numbers. But he's Justin Campbell on Twitter. He he he's, he had Remzo Martinez. They were talking about that. Apparently, like uh, something like Pornhub actually could very well, you know, so far as like tech, social media platforms. So, it, there may be some sort of opening there or at least a template that can be used for the future because because of the fact of what they are, they've had to become pretty, I, I don't know, what's, I forget uh, what word I'm trying to get at, but uh, essentially it, they've, got, they've had to get pretty good at like figuring out how to, what's the word, like censor in a way, but not mm-hmm. in a bad way. Yeah. So because like- Regulate the content. They've had to yeah. figure out how to do that. They're yeah they're 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 one in a weird way probably one of the best places you could use is like a as a free speech platform because mm-hmm. unless you're like doing something insane they're probably you know whatever yeah. like they don't care um, and so they've been kind of been able to keep the actors out that want that type of censorship you know just because of the fact that they're like porn there's a lot of people against porn. Yeah. Well, but my yeah. understanding of how Pornhub works is they don't have a, they don't have a lot of AI to take things down. They have a lot of manual yeah. reviews because if you had AI do it, you know, they'd be Kristen Mom's mass reporting everything, and yeah. so they have a lot of manual checking, which is a way they really you know fight back against the algorithms. Yeah, no, yeah, that makes sense. But I, I do think I, I don't know. You guys should go check out that episode of uh, I forget the name of his uh show right now off the top of my head. Uh, oh, fact check this. So uh, you should mm-hmm. go check that out. They go into that a lot. I mean, that's like they go deep, nerdy, like uh, social media platforms and stuff like that. They're kind of going to that type of stuff. Uh, so if that's something that interests you, but they go into that as well. But yeah, let's go ahead and go in, get into it. We're doing chapter two and ideally th- we're shooting for three as well today. Uh, that's the goal. I um, mean, if we if we if it takes too long, if we get too much upside, we just do the one chapter. But uh, yeah, that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, I, f- I figure I'll probably read this chapter and then I'll, ha- I'll let you read the next one. Um, to me. And we'll, uh, yeah, well, obviously we'll stop, you know, with take breaks in between and such. Um, all right, we're in chapter two, applied economics. Agorism is more than economics, but agorist thinking is impossible without that ba- basic understanding. Just applying the basic economics we have learned so far can sweep away a lot of misconceptions, elimin- eliminate a lot of confusion about how the world works. We also can deal with some of the misleading con jobs of economics. However, explaining why economics is so twisted, we'll have to wait until we apply libertarianism later. 
Um, yeah, I mean, we don't really have much to go into that one. He's just kind of breaking yeah. down what algorithm is. Um, yeah. And it is more than economics. It's a, it's a little bit more of that. There's definitely more theory that goes yeah. into it. But at the same time, I would actually say, uh, in a sense, everything is economics. So, mm -hmm. But I get what he's getting at. It's, it's more than just that. But all right. Um, the free market. Algorithm holds up, upholds the free market. To understand why, one first needs to know what the free market is and what its alternatives are. Again, why is left for later? The term agorism is derived from the ancient Greek word agora, meaning an open marketplace, which I, I do think that's one important thing to understand of when one, a lot of the verbiage that's used with agorism and stuff, and they'll talk about the agora, uh, mm -hmm. stuff like that. That's, this is what they're talking about. They're just talking about the market uh, is essentially yeah. what they're saying. Um, the market is not a single place or center. Goods and services are exchanged at the corner store, on the stock exchange, at the swap meet, in your backyard, or across the internet. Playing a game with a friend is not a market transaction, but foregoing the time that each of you could spend on working or buying or selling is a market transaction. And that kind of plays on what I was talking about with everything is economics. Even that, you know, something that the absence of like money per se is the same thing. And, mm -hmm. and money, all it is, is a signifier of value. Yeah, so, like not non accent yes. is an accent. That's what yes. I, to, I learned from human accent. <laughs> yes. So yeah, you spending time with your friends is you're foregoing the opportunity to, to relax, uh, make money, do do whatever. And those are in a in a sense also an economic action. So I mean, and you can also make an autistic argument about how spending time with your friends or relaxing allows you to be more better equipped to be able to make money mm -hmm. later. Uh, cause yeah. you know, your body, you're mortal and you need that type of, uh, you can't just only make money all the time. So yeah, we're not, I mean, we're not sigmas. We don't, we're not constantly on the grind. Yeah. Uh, all social interaction has a market component. Economics may be far more pervasive than we thought. It is difficult to imagine how we could have a free society. Should we wish it without a free market? Perhaps we should be clear with reference by what we mean by free, uh, or with reference to what we mean by free. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is still going on about how everything's economics. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, um, I'm bad. Yeah, I, d I do like that line. It's difficult to imagine how we could have a free society should we wish it without a free market because those are things that are basically synonymous, which is this is where you get into a lot of the, the, the non anarchist or non libertarian gobbledygook. Well, they'll, they'll, they'll say, Oh, I like freedom, I like liberty, I like this, say that. Oh, we need to regulate this, we need to regulate that. And like, yeah wait wait what like that's like how these things don't comport like these you can't have one with the other you know so yeah. um uh, do, do free means the absence of coercion coercion is threatening violence upon someone in order to make him surrender something in a strictly value free sense then coercive human action offers a greater disvalue to you if you do not yield up your lesser value you gain nothing but lose less. Uh, that's a good way of putting it. It's like a, it's a, essentially, he's just saying it's essentially a negative value, which makes sense because, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, repeated application of coercion destroys values. The coercer, ga coercer gains without producing anything of value and the victim always loses. Voluntary exchange, as we have seen, occurs when both feel a gain in subjective value. Unease is relieved in both directions. In coercive transactions, unease is increased. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I mean, it's setting the basics of economics. It's, I yeah. do like the way it's framing it. It's a little bit different than some other people frame it. Uh, it is a little different, but I, I do. I think it's good. You know, I think yeah. it's normally when it comes to how most things are phrased. Uh, I think Conkin is a better job than most people. Yes, he's he's very he's good at simplifying it, and it's been like this is it. It's very simple. A dummy can get it, so I get it, but. Yeah, I do like how concise he is, and uh, and it's. I mean, maybe some nuance can be lost in the conciseness, but I do feel like it. Uh, it generally speaking, he's very good at like not losing anything essential in making it concise. Um, because I, I, yeah, I don't necessarily disagree with any of this at all. Um, yeah, because yeah, I mean that's how value works. You know, to say like if we trade. Uh, we essentially, and it's, we both agree, then it, I'm getting something I value more than whatever I gave you and vice versa. Whereas it's a little bit different when it's coercive, it's I'm getting something and you're losing something. So it's kind of, it's a situation where it's a, it's a difference between a win, lose and a win, win. Uh, yeah. so yeah.
which obviously the idea is we're, we're trying to create a situation where and, it's always win-win. Yeah, so. and I, I absolutely hear so many people say things like, well, it's not a win-win because I don't want to make the trade. It's like, well, if you don't want to make the trade, why did you trade? You yeah. know, it's like a lot of people are like, well, I, I needed the trade. Like, okay, because you needed to. You still showed that need is more important than the value of whatever it was you had. Like, it may not be happy with it, but you chose the value that things differently. And it's and I get really artistic about it when people be like, and and I, I didn't want to make the trade. Like, well, why did you do it then? Well, I needed to. And then you clearly wanted to. Yes. It's like <laughs> I, I get really artistic about those arguments people make. I mean, really, uh, when you're talking about needs and wants, which is actually one of those things that applies to like the public goods argument, uh, mm-hmm. essentially, uh, which we're, we're not in that in the book. But I do find it funny how like need and want is really just almost like a spectrum and it's like they're mm-hmm. almost and i'm not to say there aren't things humans need but in a certain sense all that a need is is a really strong want yeah so, like, it, uh, yeah sure i mean there are certain things you can be like this is a need need but uh, i mean i know very rarely is it actually a you know a cemented need need you know like yeah. but i don't know it, that's why it's kind of like a spectrum thing um uh, retrieving your goods from the coercer, coercer with the threat of greater force and enough extra for your time and trouble at least wipes out your loss, although it leaves the original coercer with a net loss. At this point, he may finally become aware of the value destruction of coercion, or he may simply decide he needs still greater force. The bigger force of all in an area is usually a state, but we'll come to that later. Um, I think he's kind of getting at how the uh, here he's kind of getting out the idea of how. Um, it's a lot of the production pr- predation thing because it's a like I know I said it's a win lose you know when someone coerces, uh, but it's actually it's overall a loss um, because yeah. it is you are uh, impeding on production um, and yeah and it, that's kind of what it goes back to like now say that person wanted to return for us it's like you're, you're kind of just slowly destroying more and more value overall um, in, a, in a speaking in, a, in an autistic fashion here. Mm-hmm. Um, Strictly for speaking, the free market is the absence of all that coercion. If there were only a few private thieves and they were usually apprehended and forced to make restitution, something very close to a free market would exist. People would have locks, fences, alarms, insurance policies, and protection agent policies, but would act otherwise in the assumption that they were free to give up their property to those of their choice and accept from others who gave freely to them. They could not plan on people changing their minds but they could make contracts exchanging a good here and there and now for one to be given later so that if others change their minds, some compensation would result. Uh, if you have anything on to that, we'll move on to the next section. If not, yeah. All right. Planning and chaos. It quickly becomes clear that planning is far more practical in a free market than in a coerced market. If coercion becomes regular and predictable, innovative people find ways around it and soon enough join forces to evade the coercive regulations, frustrating and or starving the coercer. So see the next chapter. So we'll get into that more later. Mm-hmm. Um, so new forms of coercion must be brought in and economic planning is disrupted once again. Um, you know, I kind of brought to mind the boom bust cycle, which is kind of like the issue with this is what they're kind of getting when you have coercion in a market. I know in uh, I've only read like half of Man, Economy, and State, but I, I forget what the term Rothbard uses, but he kind of creates this like theoretical like free market, and this is what he kind of bla- bases his theory off of, and how it would be more consistent, and you could easier you could you could you'd have a more consistent market, and you have wouldn't have these weird fluctuations and like uh, shit like that, and um, yeah, I mean it's it's that's kind of what they're getting at, but when you have like the boom bust cycle or coercion that enters the system, it causes all sorts of um, distortions which uh you know w- will cause more distortions will cause other distortions in other areas and it makes it incre- very hard to be predictable because then it just like it creates these add-on effects and so on and so forth and uh yeah i mean obviously there are people who can account for it but yeah i just i, I thought that was interesting um so new forms of, mo- of coercion must be brought in economic planning is disrupted once again some argue that a free market is chaos. There's, they see no one giving orders and so think that there is no order. In reality, a completely free market is a highly decentralized order. Each cog in the great machine keeps itself well-oiled and seeks to mesh itself with the other cogs in ever better fits. An even better example is the human body. While the brain has some overall direction, it cannot, it cannot instruct various cells to go about their ways. Delivering blood and building tissue and contracting muscle and transmitting energy. A disease or parasite may direct some cells to a common task, but this is this 
uh, but this results in disruption of the natural order. Even without a foreign invader, if the brain could force themselves to act other than naturally, the entire body would suffer by this imposed order and the body would die. The fallacy in planned economics is the error of assuming that order is imposed. Scientists are aware that order is something you look for in nature. It's, uh, it's, it's already there. Economics tells us that attempts to impose order by coercion are destructive and chaotic, yet economic planning of the imposing kind is common to nearly all schools of economics. We begin to see where the gap between small E economics and big E economics lies. Uh, if you have the end to that, through a lot there, there's a lot Man, he's working with as well. No, I mean, anything I could say, he said better, you know? So that's <laughs> really how I feel about these economic chapters. Stuff in the yeah, app. I mean, try to, I do like how he uses the body example, and he kind of points out how uh, the, the order, and that kind of goes to where some of the boom-bust cycle, which, I mean, I know you people are like, oh, I'm going to plan this thing, but the problem is there's always things you can't account for, and yeah. when you try to impose order, those other, th- like, you essentially create, like I said, these distortions, that then create other issues, and then you try to be like, "Oh, well, I'm going to fix that with this this directive," and yeah. and and it it just falls apart. Whereas like he kind of makes the idea of it's like like this decentralized like the body with every cell. Like mm-hmm. even if the brain was to fucking try to be like, "I'm going to direct these cells to do this," it would probably just fuck everything up. Because um, yeah. it's it's the same idea of like the federal government or the president trying to make you know say with like his OSHA thing or whatever, like the hundred and there or now it's even less than hundred. It's like you really like, I mean, let's even say that the, this, this vaccine is legit and all that shit. Everything's on the up and up. Like, you know, it, it's like a miracle fucking drug. It's like, okay, but you don't know about the different industries and how this could affect. And like, mm-hmm. this could cause other issues. So we're dealing with like supply chain stuff. This is kind of yeah. the perfect time to be reading this book. Uh, considering, uh, I'd say, I think counter economics if is probably, uh, one of the most important things we might have to deal with in the future, and then uh, mm-hmm. it, it, this is a book great ex- it, explaining the issues we're seeing. So Dude, I was at Publix and I couldn't find my tater tots. Immediately, I was like, "Okay, how do I agar with this sit? How do I agar with tater tots into existence? I need my fucking tots. <laughs> I need to grow some fucking taters." <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, God, you know, what? Uh, it's not to go off on a tangent though. Uh, I I'd go. You can look at this later. Apparently, Evergrande I think just defaulted. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that, which is Chinese, bi- uh, China's big, like I think mortgage company or some shit. Wow. So a lot of people think that's like the first domino of them uh, collapsing, which means they'll likely adopt our fiat more, which actually could result in a huge deflationary pr- uh, pressure for us, which would be good for people like me and you who know what's up. And then we can like take, apply that and like gives us a little bit more time, but for everybody else it's probably going to make the next bust worse. Because yeah. this kind of just saved our ass and gave us a boom, you know. <laughs> yeah, is it, I think uh, right right now Pete and Scott are going live to talk about it on the end of the empire, and so I'm definitely gonna be checking that out tomorrow just to see what the host yeah. situation is. Yeah, definitely. Anyone listening should check them out. They'll be able to say, have way more to say on it than we will. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, competition and monopoly. It's nice if more than one person offers to trade the same thing with you. You usually can get a better deal. When more than one seller offers identical goods and when more than one buyer offers to acquire the same goods, pure competition exists. If only one buyer or seller is available, the buyer or seller is said to have a monopoly. Uh, Competition is always good in the sense that it maximizes value exchanges. Although it would take more theory to prove this, most people have had enough experience to accept the foregoing as a factual statement. Sure. Surely not all monopoly is bad. Bad. If we banned all monopoly, then Leonardo da Vinci would have had to give up painting what only he could paint, or what only he can paint. Um, and the Beatles would have had to stop composing what only they can compose. In fact, since a little bit of artistry distinguishes all goods, pure competition is impossible. There are no identical products. Which I, I like this too because it kind of points out that like monopoly in a certain kind of sense is kind of retarded because it's like there is no in a true sense, there is like really, I mean, I guess I wouldn't say there's no, but like the idea of someone have a monopoly, it's like, well, someone else might create something different. Like, okay, cool. Like someone out, I'm sure there might be some, someone out there that has a monopoly on VHS. It's like, cool. Like, uh, well, I'm sorry. The DVD came along and crushed your fucking game. Mm-hmm. So yeah. like it, and these are like different, these are similar, but different. It, yeah. yeah. And I it's like the, when a monopoly does exist is, that's a constantly innovating and preparing for the next wave of the market. The next little guy can build something up that kind of breaks it. And so the only way a monopoly, like 
it's probably to say, but only when we can exist is the only, not only prevents our competition, but it also prevents any advancement in, in industry. What I think what happened several times with like advancements coming along, and they're like, well, how would that affect such and such industry? You know, and they try to stop the advancements. I'm blanking on any example, but I'm, I noticed some examples of them doing that. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know why, but it came to mind when you're talking Krugman's uh, statement about the fucking uh, the internet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. That is a f- I love, fucking love hearing that story. Every time I hear that line, I, I'm laughing my ass off. Yeah. No, it's great whenever it says some dumb shit on Twitter. People just share that. Um, <laughs> yet, for your subjective purposes, you can see no difference worth paying for among all sorts of goods. Yet, they do not have to be all that similar. With $15, you might decide to buy a book you wish to spend the evening with. Finding the book sold, you consider a movie instead. The lines are too long, so you buy a six-pack instead and go home. Someone else would have had different goods competing for that $15, even if he had started out trying to buy that same book. If I told you at this point that some economists define a free market as a perfectly competitive market, you might wonder when they lost their senses. After all, if people want to produce different things, remember division of labor, and are more productive in doing so, you will not get perfect competition in the free market. You will have lots of competition by giving each human actor maximum freedom to explore his values and find alternatives. I do like how he kind of applies that, like, uh, like he kind of, like, essentially everything's competing for your value or for your mm-hmm. dollars or whatever the fuck. So it's I, the, the concept of, like, a monopoly or whatever, like, even in, in a certain sense, yeah, they may have a monopoly on that product, but you might go, eh, well, I don't want that product. You get a product that's not even of the same uh, specific thing. Say you decide, say milk. You know, we uh, like say with inflation and everything. Say milk gets ridiculously fucking expensive. For some reason, milk goes through the roof. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are just gonna stop getting milk. Yeah. It, like, cool. You have a monopoly in the milk market. Uh, some, you know, milk monopolist or whatever the fuck. It's like, okay, cool. Like, if you go insane with this fucking so-called power of milk monopoly, yeah, it's going to have some issues. There's gonna be a lot of people going. Well, I don't know. Maybe almond milk isn't so fucking bad. I mean, or or, or whatever. You know, it, it, it points to the example that no monopoly is ever really no natural monopoly ever really behaved like a monopoly. So, like Rockefeller was the only legit like probably closely ever had to like a natural monopoly, and prices went down and servers went up every year. You know, and so like monopolies don't even behave the way like the boogeyman monopoly would behave. Only the government monopolies behave like that. And yeah. So it's, uh, do, 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 do. uh, where the fuck did I leave off at? Uh, do, do. um, let me see. By, by in the middle, I think. Second, after paragraph. all, people, after all, if people want to produce different things, remember division labor are more productive in doing so. You will not get perfect competition in free market. You have lots of competition by giving each, I'm just reading over the same thing, by giving each home, human actor maximum freedom to explore his values and find alternatives. Now, if I tell you that these economists say that. If a market is not perfectly competitive, force should make it should be used to make it so. You're probably beginning to wonder if I have not lost my senses. Whatever these economists are after is not a free market, nor will they generate any gain since values are always net destroyed by coercion. Adam Smith, uh, I just do want to touch on it real quick. That's what I was getting at earlier with net destroyed. Whenever you have coercion enters it, it it does have a net destruction of value. So, like, yes, there is going to be a winner, the coercer in this situation, but there and there will be a loser. But overall, the losing outgains the winning. So, um, I don't know who was it that uh, it's reading the Tana Hills recently, uh, and that that was one thing they went into a lot. In that, uh, in a in a truly free market, a lot of these things would go out of style simply from a you know, if you're looking at it from a, co- a coercion type perspective of like just because of the fact that you're you're losing value like this isn't mm-hmm. something that can be done at you know th- at that large without some sort of like gigantic organization the state to uphold it um it, it takes a lot of for the state to be able to uphold this shit they're doing essentially yeah. so and it's this is why what we're getting at you know through economics you can kind of apply principles that this shit will fail eventually mm-hmm. you know like yeah. i mean i'm sure it'll transform into different ways but it's like an ever deteriorating entity that may just shift shape, shapes into something else. So, yeah. not to get but, too yeah. off topic, but um, are you an, are you are you an accelerationist? I keep seeing your name attached to the accelerationist podcast. Uh, like yes and no. I don't think accelerationist is the right way to put it. I think the proper praxis going forward will have an accelerationist 
uh, effect, but I think it's like this yin and yang. And this is kind of like a, I've applied it to like archotropism because uh, I've kind of like, that was something when uh, Andrew came out with that, like I, I was like, okay, okay. It kind of applied it to like agorism. And I know agorism, which I mean, I don't know if we'll get into this book, that kind of has this idea that like one day that like, you know, have the big, actually it's more than NLM, the other book. It goes into how they have the big, like, you know, the different phases and that it'll defeat yeah. the state. And I think of it more of a, like a, I, I think it like, it's more like as we get like increase liberty, I think in a weird way, uh, authoritarianism also kind of increases, but in different mm -hmm. ways. Um, so I think as we, as we start applying more agorism or count or counter economics, as we create a more free area or create pockets of liberty, I think that the, the inverse effect is that we'll also create pockets of authority, uh, yeah. or maybe not authority, but of authoritarianism. Um, and so, yeah, I think naturally the effect of agorism, and this is kind of what like hop, like a lot of Hoppians points are about like against agorism is that it makes things worse. And I'm like, I agree, but it also makes things better. Yeah. So it's it's, uh, it's like most medicine tastes bad, but it makes things better. You know, it's kind of yeah, a, well, not even that. It's more the idea of that, like it's kind of because he, you know, with Andrew, he applies like archotropism. It's like almost like the laws of thermodynamics. And yeah. I so the way I look at like freedom and authoritarianism uh, is kind of like um, and I know he applies his theory to power. Uh, so it's not even and it's not even and you, we, me and you are right wing anarchists. So we have no we don't have an issue with power. We have an issue with coercive power. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so like, so you got to kind of look at it through that, that, that lens when he's talking about power. So if we're roughly just like not just delineating between coercive and non-coercive power, the way I see it, you know, you have Liberty or, or I don't even know what you would say the opposite of it. Cause I mean, you can have Liberty and power, but you know, if you have power and something else, if Liberty infringes on it, like it pushes it, I think it will just create a, it's kind of like a fluid. Like, I don't know if you mm -hmm. understand hydraulics. Well, you know, like if you have 10, 10 square, uh, 10 square feet and you have five square feet of it is, you know, Liberty and five square feet's power. I do think it's going to, as the Liberty pushes, as the Liberty increases, it will like, say it takes on 7.5 square feet. I do think the, uh, the, the, like the, the authoritarianism will take on that 2.5 square feet, but it will become more compressed. It will be like kind of the same yeah. idea. It's more, more concentrated, if that makes yeah. sense. So it's kind of like a yeah. liquid. In a, uh, in a, it, it makes sense, you know? So yeah. if any, it's, if anything, it's like the state has to be like flex its hypothetically, the state has to flex its power. Like, no, see, we're actually still in control. You yeah. Know, even though it's not, but they have to make it look like that. It'll at least make it feel like they are. So they're going to really hype lock down one location to make sure they at least feel in power. Yeah, this is why my theory for the future, I think we're going to see, and this somewhat kind of comports to agorism, mm -hmm. uh, and also, like, I do think we're going to see more, like, a authoritarian city-states in the future, but then you're going to mm -hmm. have, I think we're likely going to have, like, in the outskirts and more rural areas, it will be areas where, yes, it's not technically anarchy, but it's, like, the state kind of doesn't really, like, yeah. fuck with you out here, like... And so that's kind of what I see. And so we'll have it's kind, of how, yeah. it's kind of like what Australia is a little bit like. I have yeah. a friend in West Australia, and it's just like, you know, everything's gone to shit. But the yeah. guy in East Australia is basically, they just leave me the fuck alone out here. And so yeah. it's kind of like exactly. that. Yeah, which is kind of what we're going to get. Like, like in, like, that's why I think people should try to move or to pockets of liberty if they can, because mm -hmm. I think that's likely the way things are going in the future. That if you're in these urban areas or especially blue state urban areas, yeah. I think it's going to be a shit show. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so the, the, yeah, they will get they'll cranked down, but with the more power the state puts on one into like in certain areas, the less they're able to put in others. So yeah. that, that's why I'm, what I'm kind of getting at, you know? So, um, okay. so yes, sort of accelerationist. I mean, cause, but it's more of a, how it's your just, perspective it's just happen, on it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's more your perspective on the matter, I guess, is the way I put it. Cause I, I do think mm -hmm. the more that we apply the proper praxis, the more it may actually seem like things are accelerating and things are going to end. Mm -hmm. I know we're all scared of collapse and blah, 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 but I don't think, I think our idea of collapse may be a little bit distorted or the end of an empire. Yeah. We're like, Oh my God. Oh my God. It doesn't necessarily have to be yeah. something fucking insane. Like, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm prepared for the wasteland for Mad Max. I'm going yeah. to I'm gonna learn how to make beer and it's like, Hey guys, I can, I can make alcohol. Keep me alive. Yeah, Cause that's what people think of when they think of like a collapse of an empire. And I, yeah. I don't necessarily think it's 
probably gonna be like i mean maybe there's some areas will be violence and insane yeah. shit and like I you know can't strife. See my, I, I can't see my city to do anything crazy like the, the government if, if the government does collapse i see just my city killing well what do y'all want to do now like, yeah. I just, we're just gonna like same yeah. city as always okay yeah like i mean life goes on like i you know, yeah. people like uh, 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 yeah I mean, yeah, maybe the currency will go to shit, but it's like, okay, well, people will use different currencies, and yeah, it may suck yeah. for a while. And I, I know, and, and yes, there, I'm not at all discounting that like collapses probably have huge like effects in certain areas. And yes, there'll be maybe a lot of people that die for you know this reason or that reason, but it's there will also be areas where that's not the case. So it's like that's why we're kind of doing here like. That's kind of what a lot of agorism is like. Hey, here are things you can do to. Yes, it's not the silver bullet. You know, everyone always tries to be with any, any praxis, be like, oh, you think this is going to fucking fix it? And it's like, well, I mean, it's not this magic thing, but it's like, yeah. here are the principles, start to apply them, and you're better, you're going to be in a better, uh, you're going to be in a better place, most likely. It doesn't mean it's going to 100% work, or, you know, yeah. you'll, you're, you're, they won't come for you and put you in the gulags, but you're less likely to if you follow this, these, these templates or these uh, blueprints we're laying out. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyways, Adam Smith defined monopoly as a grant of exclusive trading by the king. It was a royal privilege. That is, the state coerced some people not to produce goods when the king's friend was already doing so. Breaking up these forced monopolies is an issue for freedom lovers, and rightfully so. Uh, on your episode with uh, Kinsella, uh, you, you, your IP one, you guys talked about mm -hmm. that a lot. That applies to uh, the problems arose when people stopped thinking clearly or had their thoughts muddled by economists. Monopoly became bad, not because it was coercive, but because it was not competitive. And I, I do think uh, that's that's the, the, the thing. Like, if you have a coercive monopoly, we have an issue. It's coercion is the issue. If you have a monopoly, it's kind of like, who cares as long as it's not coercive? Um, and even then, it's probably most likely not really a monopoly. But clear thinking and consistency led us easily to realize that the opposite of forced monopoly and a forced competition is natural monopoly and free competition. The correct opposition is a, co a coerced market versus the free market. I don't have anything to add. Uh, we'll move on to the next section. Yeah, so I, I, my phone was blowing up. And I saw something Stefan said. I, I just had to respond real quick. <laughs> oh, you're good. Sorry. It's just, it was a really autistic. He was saying, like, so you want drug addicts to be what? Keynesians? I'm like, no, I want them not to be drug addicts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, one problem with Monopoly, uh, well, this section is cartels. One problem with Monopoly we seem to have overlooked. Do not let the big get bigger and the small get driven out, even if the market is left alone. Um, the answer is obvious empirically. The historically it has never happened. There is extensive literature by the better sort of economists on many historical examples where businesses were accused of forming trusts, that is, attempting to monopolize one industry through cartels. Most cases, when state trust busters were brought in to break up a large company, proved to have been instigated by smaller companies against a more efficient competitor. Uh, that's pretty important. Uh, cartels, as Dr. Murray Rothbard has beautifully shown, tend to break up from market forces. The most efficient cartel member can outsell his fellow members and has tremendous incentive to cheat on the cartel agreement. He can seal the customers from his fellow members and soon does under the table. Upon discovery, his fellow car cartel members fight back by cutting prices and the cartel disintegrates. In a coerced market, however, the cartel will run to someone to force compliance with the cartel. That someone is in any realistic unfree market the state. And once again, we are back to the force, the forced or state monopoly, which is, I do like how he puts out, points out in a free market, the uh, uh, monopolies aren't basically a thing because they naturally break up. And the only reason to fight those uh, incentives for breaking up is to apply coercion. Only once there's coercion involved, do they go, Oh, well it, we have, there's advantages to us sticking together and to mm -hmm. actually have this monopoly. Whereas in a true free market, there are forces that drive them to not do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Don't have anything to add to that? No, nah, just uh, oh, I, wait, tell me, every time I put a bit monopoly or stuff like anarchy, I always get this. I, I come response I get is um, so what are you gonna do when the state when the when Walmart hires people to force you to stop there? It's like <laughs> suit them, probably. Yeah. I mean, but fuck yeah, what, what else am I gonna do? It's it's just if people people really need to understand like basic economics and monopoly stuff because so many of the stupid arguments stem from not knowing how those work. Yeah, it's like basic economics just need to be him at home. 
Oh yeah, no, it is. It is astonishing once you realize how little people know. But then you think back, like what you used to know, and you're like, oh yeah, I mean, the, the, I knew that things even thought about. <laughs> yeah. All right, profit and enterprise. Sometimes the terms free enterprise and capitalism are used to mean free market. Capitalism means the ideology of capital or capitalist. Before Marx came along, the pure the pure free marketeer Thomas Hodgkin had already used the term capitalism as pejorative. Capitalists were trying to use coercion in the state to restrict the market. I do think it's a key point. A lot of people get hung up on words. I don't mean to go on a long one. And you know, have your own opinion on whether we should be hung up on words or not. I'm of the opinion I'll like I'm not going to stick to a word to define something if I know it doesn't meet my ends. Yeah. So I don't care. I'll use whatever word I need to. If if I know capitalism is a word that does it for you and you have good things associated with it and we're not going to have to have a half hour conversation about how to break this down and like mm -hmm. what I mean when I say capitalism. But I do think it's important that you point out that it literally is we – we are not the like us, you know, and caps as I would like, I would describe myself as an agorist and an ANCAP. Um, I think agorist is like a more is kind of like a, a subset of a, a, a ANCAP yeah. essentially. Um, I mean, although they're they it kind of like crosses over, there are lefties who consider themselves mm -hmm. in that wouldn't consider themselves ANCAPs, but whatever. Um, anyways, was, my point being is we are not the originators and it was originally used as a pejorative. So a lot of yeah. try, people try to say, like, oh, you know, this is what capitalism means, and this is where the left kind of has a point where they're like, no, it doesn't. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, but it doesn't it kind of doesn't fucking matter what it means. Yeah. Like we're using it to mean this. And that's yeah. what we need to use. If we're using this, and, and this is where we get into the whole fucking stupid uh semantics, and they're technically right in that it's like <laughs> it was mean it was it was meant to mean when we yeah. say crony capitalism, that's what it was the original meaning of capitalism was. Yeah. Uh so I mean I'm not saying you're wrong to use the word to capitalism to not mean crony capitalism mm. but that is what the original meaning of capitalism was yeah. so I, i've always before like market anarchists and that kind of stuff yeah. um i will say he keeps saying free market or that uh, the way to determine like, an actual market uh i like hopper's uh clean capitalism i, I was what i prefer because it's like yeah clean simple no closing yeah clean capitalism i like that but, too because it kind of it kind of in a sense in a um in a rhetorical way, it kind of almost in a weird way concedes to the lefty to where if you're having a discussion with the socialists about the capitalism, socialism, because it's always the word shit. If you say, well, I'm talking about clean capitalism, it kind of concedes that capitalism is dirty, but I'm give this is I'm saying like a yeah. absent this, this bad stuff. So it is like a little bit of a, a minor I deviation. You, I don't know if you listened to it, but um, Bud went, I think it was Bud. It was Pat. I almost annoyed. Someone was almost Pete to talk about uh, Marxism, and they did a whole episode on Hopper being the, a, a weird post-Marxist. It was yeah, that was Bird. great episode. Great episode. Yeah, it no, it, it is blowing. cool once you start applying, like you realize how Hopper's thinking. A lot of it was derived from the left, and it is kind, mm -hmm. it's kind of cool. There, there's there's a lot of interplay with the left, and uh, you know, uh, like right in your kiss. And there's a lot you said. I, I've covered some of this, like my episode with Ace, where we mm -hmm. covered Benjamin Tucker, like my Anarchist Handbook episode. And how he was a socialist, but if you read it, like you could literally read his essay in in, in the Anarchist Handbook, and if you, there's a if you just literally swapped out the word socialist with capitalist and you gave that book to an ANCAP, they would think it was describing in capital or yeah. anarcho capitalism. They they just would. Uh, but like aside from there's like a minor little area of if you're a well trained one, you would realize because he does kind of go into the the theory of value a little bit and can you the mm -hmm. left are more like labor theory of value and he kind of goes in that a little bit but like you, if you aren't a well-trained one that might you might that might totally slip your eye and yeah like yeah i, I highly suggest people check it out there's definitely far more interplay between the left and the right anarchists and you know what we mean by left and right that's a whole fucking other mixed yeah. bag and that's another conversation i mean yeah. i think people know what we mean by left and right in this in this sense so yeah yeah. Uh, I, I will say Hopper has a lecture on YouTube. It's a uh, what Marx got right, and it's arguably my favorite video on YouTube. Like it yeah. is a incredible video. If everybody listening, uh, so definitely watch it. Yeah, Marx. Or, yeah, that one's pretty good. But uh, you know, Marx had some. Uh, there was definitely some, some, some truth to some of the shit he said. Um, you know, but uh, all right, profit and enterprise. Oh yeah, I already said that. Do, 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 do. All right. Capitalism then does not describe a free market, but a form of statism like communism, which I mean, I, I, I don't it, once again, this is kind of goes into a, what do you mean by the word? Uh, so, I mean, I don't necessarily disagree with him or, nor disagree with him here. He, he has a point. Um, um, so he's more meaning in the original sense of capitalism. I know there's going to be people like probably reading about this, but I really don't give a shit. 
what he yeah. means when he's saying this is the capitalism he's speaking of is the original uh, original use of the word. Um, so, and he's also saying communism shit as well. Um, so, free enterprise can only exist in a free market and is an acceptable pseudonym. Yet, while the term market covers all human transactions, enterprise seems to be limited to certain types of businesses. And what about profit? Is it the result of exploita exploitation, enterprise, hard work, or something else? Applying economic knowledge here resolves the problem clearly, but it will take a little effort to follow through. According to Austrian economics, there are three productive functions in the marketplace. Labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. In the simplest primitive economy, capital consists of tools. Food you have stored to keep you going until your harvest comes in, or you can sell the shoes you made and storefronts or wagons to take your goods to market. Labor is the work you put into farming or shoemaking or whatever. Entrepreneurship is direction, the reins of the operation, deciding where to invest the capital and which and how many workers to hire. As the market progresses to greater wealth and complexity, we can see that the important components of entrepreneurship are risk-taking and innovation. Speculators, inventors, and artists without patrons are the best-known, fairly pure entrepreneurs. They take risks, create a product that did not exist before, which just turns out to have a demand, a better product to replace one that existed before, winning away the demand, a cheaper method of producing a marketing or marketing the same product, again winning away the demand. The gain resulting from pure entrepreneurship is profit. It is not the everyday return on investment that a businessman counts over expensive and takes home. I kind of want to break down all that, but I, I think he puts it so well that I don't really want to go into it. Uh, yeah. I feel like I would take away from him. Um, windfall profits occur when there is a sudden change in market uh, conditions, such as weather wiping out crops or producing bumper harvests. Mineral and oil strikes suddenly coming onto the market when the market is not free, sudden government interference in the marketplace. Those who make the most effort to anticipate the unexpected tend to make the most profits. Taking risks also means one can introduce products no one wants, invent devices that are laughed away, and create artsy trash. Such creations incur negative profit, loss, and alas, there is at least, there is at least as common historically as profit. Nonetheless, without entrepreneurship enterprise, the economy is stagnate as people continue investing the same capital in the same way over and over and workers continue at the same jobs. When skilled laborers begin to die out and capital runs out for components such as minerals at mines or new forests for timber, the economy would regress or collapse. Everyone is part laborer, pan capitalist and part, and part entrepreneur, but by division of labor, we tend to specialize. There is something to prevent us from all being wealthy and using our money as a way of keeping score and capital investment. And capital in the form of ever more intelligent computers can reduce labor to a vestigial activity as necessary. Oh, never mind. Entrepreneurship, on the other hand, is increased, not decreased, by a progressive market. As our society becomes more complex and more wealthy, more people will specialize in entrepreneurial activity and more people must be free to do so. Entrepreneurship cannot be forced. When bureaucrats plan, they spend their time finding ways of covering their posteriors, their asses, mm -hmm. and pass the losses on to the taxpayers. Uh, they fear replacement since they reap little or no reward for success and become they become timid about actually taking risks and spend their time creating red tape and tangments designed to stimmy innovation. I like the way he put frames it there at the end. He kind of essentially, in a sense, positions the government or the central planner as in a sense a sort of entrepreneur but an entrepreneur that doesn't have a key side of entrepreneurship which is the the loss aspect because that's what keeps you honest or what causes you to fail and like uh you know i mean if you're an entrepreneur that's going to fail you have more more riding on it and you're more likely to get it right I mean, maybe not more likely to get it right but you have a consequence if you fuck up whereas mm -hmm. the government does not and this yeah. is yeah so i don't have anything to add to that there's a lot in that bit but yeah. Um, what somebody said in the last page, where was it? Um, everyone is part laborer, parent capitalist, and part entrepreneur. But by division of labor, we tend to specialize. There's nothing to prevent us from being rosy. I would say there's somebody about this that um, he says that as we grow, we all become entrepreneurs in a sense. And all I could think of is the uh, Jason Sapin's most powered influence. You have to turn yourself into your own company and focus on yourself as entrepreneur. Like that is I'm trying to figure out now. I'm thinking I'll use AutoCAD class, become a contractor with it. And so it's like turning myself into a business sort of. 
Yeah. And it's definitely something to what he's saying there about late late stage capitalism kind of having that effect. It's interesting. Yeah. I, I've been saying for a while that uh, the wealth, power, and influence is essentially uh, just a, a agorism with a little bit different aesthetics. Yeah. I know some people may disagree. Uh, I the only thing that I found that is not um, that isn't that may or may not comport with agorism is I know he pushes for uh, if you're in a spot where you can uh, to use a lobbyist to your advantage, which yeah. I don't. I mean, you might even be able to make an agorist argument for it because it's like. I know that might be political, and I know uh, Konkin is completely against political altogether. But it's a little mm. bit different. I, I don't know. It's kind of a gray area. Uh, so mm. I don't even. I don't even know if it's necessarily not. Yeah. You know, I, technically pure agorism. I, I. I don't fucking know. It's a little bit. Uh, I, I. I did see recently. Jason Sapleton was trying to get so bisop on the podcast to kind of yeah. talk about like if you're going to get into politics, having to build, having to build your votes up and your influence up first, and their effect. And so, mm. if that podcast does happen, I think that's going to really be like the mixing of. Counter economics, algorithm, counter economic entrepreneurship mixed with the paleo strategy was basically the hopper conk and stuff we've been talking about. And so I think that would yeah. be a really interesting podcast if it does happen. Yeah. And thanks, Rail Tank. Uh, Agora Anarchy Action. Hell yeah. That's the uh, A3. The uh, I forget. That was uh, one of the original things for, for the Agora. Uh, but yeah, they, uh, I'm glad you're here. Uh, and I, you know, pass on the word. Um, all right. Regulation. There's nothing positive to say about regulation. Regulation hmm. is coercion. It prevents subjective values from being satisfied, protecting only those who do not wish to be protected and penalize only the law abiding. Regulation destroys initi initiative and stifles innovation. Regulation stagnates markets. Regulation can and does kill people when the regulators deny victims the right to take a chance with so-called risky medication. Regulation is motivated by fear, envy, and colossal ignorance. There's nothing that can protect innocent people more than a thorough education and a vigorous pursue, pursuit of fraud. Yet regulation of advertising and experimentation destroys information transfer and regulation of quality merely certifies incompetent professionals and protects them from fraud charges. There's it's a lot all, to say about all that. Yes. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, wow. If all the regulation passed in any country you wish to name were completely obeyed, let alone enforced, we will would all be dead. And that's one of the things I underlined when I read this, you know, uh, probably almost a year ago at this point. Um, yeah, I underlined that bit. If all the regulation passed in any country you wish to name were completely obeyed, let alone enforced, we would all be dead, which I think is an important thing to point out because it's like a lot of these things aren't enforced. This is why it's so hard to run a business. Be it's mm -hmm. like to some extent you're all, you know, you're always breaking some regulation yeah. somewhere. So that's why, you know, it's the idea of that if any cop, like if any cop in the world wants to fuck with you, if he's a thorough, uh, if he has a thorough understanding of the, of the law, he mm -hmm. can fuck you every which way. Uh, the, you can find something that's you know not the up DOJ, to code. Yeah. The, D the DOJ put out a post saying the average American breaks fifteen federal laws a day. Mm. Uh, I imagine that's high for algorists, but it's just. <laughs> Yeah, it, you get higher score when you're doing intentionally. <laughs> nice. Um, it is different too. It's like the overregulation having one. It's, it sounded like how we they got uh Capone was on tax fraud. You know, they get you on once and get you on everything. Mm -hmm. And like they, we live in such a regulated state where it's like you don't know what you're doing is wrong, and they can get you on anything. And it's it's really one of the more insidious things that the government does is they pass regulations. We're going to make sure this doesn't happen to people again, and then they just never enforce it unless they want to get one specific dude. It's yeah. Smart but evil. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, that's the issue. The thing you have as many rules as you want, and then you can apply them however you want, and then you, you kind of control the game, which I'm is a lot of uh, a, one of my main tier uh, main points with agorism and like why political involvement's kind of retarded because they've essentially over hundreds of years or thousands of years or even more, depending on how you want it, your perspective of political the political game is like they have you know maybe not even they it's almost like a natural evolution things have been put into place in the system to be a game against you. Like, yeah. so it's like, it's like playing a losing game. And this is why I say constantly, the only, in my opinion, the only pathways that have any merit are Konkin and Hoppe. And even then like a Hoppe kind of has the same issues I'm pointing at, but it's like, mm -hmm. at least on a local level, that's like probably the only area you really could make any sort of, yeah. you know, headway. And, and even then, I, I do think it would fall apart for some of the things that he's going to point out in this book over time. But at least in yeah. the meantime, you can have something, I guess. Well, you know? on a local level, I don't think it'd be hard. Like, if you say you get the mayor and the city council. You get three people on the city council and then the mayor. Mm -hmm. Anything on the books can be repealed like that. No vote needed. And so I, yeah. you can, it's just a matter of, like, making sure you find all the stuff to repeal. 
you know, that's really the only way to make sure it doesn't happen to you. Yeah. All right. Consider a particularly uh, pathological case in the United States of America. If you charge a price for your product higher than your competitors, this is taken as evidence under the Sherman Antitrust Act that you have a monopoly and charges may be brought against you. The same problem arises if you charge the same. That's considered evidence of a cartel, and you and your competitors can all be fine. Finally, if you charge less than your competitors, you are violating the fair trade laws in most states and can be arrested and fined. It's impossible to obey all the regulations. That's that's a that's a great point. That it's like literally yeah. like no matter what you do, you're 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 fucking up. Um, yeah. But uh, let's move on to the next one. I need to move on this taxation. We're probably gonna end up only doing the one chapter. Yeah, <laughs> but, I'm getting pretty tired. Yeah. Um. There is a serious moral question about taxation that we'll leave for later. Let it suffice now to recognize that taxation takes something from someone against his or her will and is a violation of his or her subjective values. Any subject or specific form of taxation directs resources counter entrepreneurially. In short, taxation has no place in a free market. Interest. There are three very closely related concepts in economics, and they have to do with capital, land, and money. It is often said that capital earns a rate of return on investment. Remember, only entrepreneurs make profits. Land earns rent and money earns interest. With an efficient medium of exchange, an entrepreneur will quickly shift from capital goods of one type to another if the rate of return is higher in one sector of a market than another. The land is a fixed form of capital, and if we are in a free market, we should expect rent to come to equal the rate of return as in other investments, assuming no risks, where profit would be added or subtracted, and so it is with interest. Originary interest is what money earns if you lend it out to an entrepreneur risk-free. Should you accept risk yourself, you may add on a risk component, a form of profit. On the same level risk in a highly developed market, interest rates should stabilize and slowly decrease as wealth increases. Only if something becomes powerful enough, coercive enough, to monopolize by force all the media of exchange or money supply and then increases so the value of each unit declines will another component appear to increase the interest rate regardless of risk. Conceivably, it would decrease the money supply so the value would be expected to increase and interest be discounted. In an extreme case, this inflationary component would could drive interest rates to zero or negative. That is, someone pays you to take his money and give it back to him later. Deflation is rare as there is very little incentive for controllers of the money supply to deflate. All right, I'm going to move on to inflation. Uh, we get moving to this. Uh, understanding how inflation works and what to do about it made the fortunes of the gold bugs an investment analyst mentioned earlier. While there is considerable fog and confusion thrown around the subject, inflation is simple enough to understand if you follow our step-by-step logic and always watch for inconsistencies. From chapter one, we know what money is. Free market could be affected to say, uh, could be affected by say a gold strike, or for s- some reason the gold was all kept in a Fort Knox by James Bond's Goldfinger nuking it. Even then, there would be a brief dip or jump in the price of gold. The price of money is simply the the inverse of the prices of everything bought with it, and stability would resume at the new level. In the worldwide market, the effect even of nuking world uh, Fort Knox would be barely noticeable. Ah, uh, God, I think uh, not to get off on tangent. I remember I was reading um. I, I wish I could remember what Rothbard one it was. It was probably one of his like money and banking or some shit. Mm. And he, uh, it was one of the multiple ones he did at money. Uh, but he goes into like a lot of our fears about like hoarding and stuff like that are kind of mm. retarded. Cause it's like, if you have someone out there who's like completely hoarding money and this is like not even saying that's in a bank. So it's not even like their money's mm. being used for other things. All it does is increase your value. Yeah. <laughs> like, so it makes your money worth more. So because it essentially has been taken out of the market and it's almost as if it never existed. So like if it's not being used in any way. So it is, it's funny once you understand like how economics really works, it throws out a lot of these concepts that you like these big boogeyman shit about like how yeah. money works. Uh, you know, like, well, there might be some Scrooge McDuck out there with a giant fucking hoard of money. That's, you know, just keeping it from everyone. It's like, well, most likely it's probably in a bank uh, and ideally in a free market bank. And even now they, that money's being used for other endeavors. So it's circulating. Mm-hmm. It's actually circulating. It's not just this thing that's sitting in the bank, but even if they had some fucking vault that they had it hidden in, it would, it would still like all it does is increase the value of your money. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I, I said it before, I'll say it again. Like if, Economics in one lesson and a few Wasp books would taught in like a public school system. I think a majority of problems would be solved. Yep. Like it's it's crazy how much a little economics goes a, goes a long way. Yeah, inflation is the increase of the money supply. 
Inflation results only when the most powerful force in society, the state, commands a monopolistic fiat money system, creates legal, legal tender laws, legal tender compels a monopoly, contracts are not upheld in other tender or money, and with army and police to back it up, forms a, a, the basis of form of money that was acceptable in the marketplace. States have imposed fiat money from scratch, find their money rapidly rejected in favor of foreign currency and gold. Uh, the usual route to inflation takes four steps. Replacement of money by certificates for the money, which is totally how that worked when we first started imply, uh, applying fiat, which is another thing I learned from Rothbard and his many works. I don't even remember which one it is with, with how the probably money a history, made. Probably a history of money and banking. And yeah, it might be that one. But in these multiple I'm, I'm ones on money. He's done a lot of good work on money. Yeah. Um, a, w- uh, a weight of gold or silver is replaced by certificate claiming an ounce of gold or pound of silver in some precious metal warehouse or bank. Two, legal definition of possession of the certificate is equivalent to possessing the wealth the government gets into the act. Three, restriction of all exchanges, save primitive barding to legal certificates. This is a creation of legal tender. Four, issuing certificates without money to back them up. At this point, we have fiat money and inflation. And there you go. He completely described how the fuck in our current dollar situation was created. It's mm-hmm. uh, they created like an earlier colonial America. They fucking have the certificates because um, for one reason or another, uh, then it they then decided to legally define them as equivalent. And then three, they started restricting the, the use of gold and stuff like that. You know, the, the original money mm-hmm. in, in exchanges. And then uh, eventually they stopped even trying to have the appearance of backing them up with money, which is what happened in the 70s with the, the the federal reserve act so yeah. there you go and here we are in full-on fiat that's destined to fucking i forget who it is but it's the the, the uh, all all paper money returns to its original value zero <laughs> so like i forget who said that but um anyways inflation leads to crack up booms uh germany 1923 and depressions us in 1929 which uh, you know, with we've talked about the boom bust cycle. If you're not aware of the boom bust cycle, I've done an episode on it forever ago with Jimmy Morrison, who did a documentary on it. It's plenty of work. Just look up boom bust cycle. Uh, I forget. There's another. There's a more technical term. I forget what it is. You might know. Um, but you know, let's say with 1929 with the Great Depression. I mean, everyone's heard of the Roaring Twenties and how fucking great it was. Uh, maybe why was it so great and why was it followed by such a shitty period in the Great Depression? boom bust like yeah you know, like that's not normal how an economy should should act um all right this analysis is a bit more complicated and it's best left to the more cataclysmic scenarios we'll present near the end of the book oh and as you probably guessed one result of inflation is a general rise in price level notice that some prices rise faster than the others and some even seem to drop only distor- distortion is common to all price changes uh anything else to add we have only one section and we're done with the chapter no, all, right. No, bad. all right, a little knowledge. If you have mastered the first two chapters, congratulations. You will quickly discover two things by simply reading your daily newspaper or news blogs uh, or shooting the breeze with your acquaintances. First, you will discover the appalling level of ignorance with which most of society is afflicted. I have that underlined. I fucking love mm-hmm. that, uh, which is true. Once you, once the scales fall off your eyes, you start even understanding basic economics, which like I don't even consider myself an economic master, but there's so much shit you see every fucking day that you're like, Oh my God, this is retarded. Like, just like having a basic grasp of economics goes yeah. so far. <laughs> like, and it's yeah. like so, like, basic. Like, when you really break it down to its basic, blo- like, basic understanding or basic logic, that you think, like, how could anyone get this wrong? But, like, obviously, this was you not too long ago. It, it's, yeah. it, it is nuts when it's you first started. It's crazy how much of, like, uh, like, for lack of a better term, it's like a white pill, you know? It's like, mm-hmm. it, it seems to you entire, like, it doesn't, it, Saves you more than you absolutely understand it, you know. And it's yeah. not like it's super hard to get. Like the Austrian people do a great job of like, you know, you know that bell curve midwit meme. Yeah, like the Austrians are perfectly on that bell curve. You can understand yeah. what they're saying, and all right. Yeah. All right. Uh, be careful. Some people get very irritable when challenged by someone who knows what he's talking about. <laughs> a knowledgeable person may be tempted to use his knowledge to bilk the ignorant. Many people with only a little knowledge do just that. However, there are moral ways to profit by your understanding and by all means go to it, which uh, I've used this, uh, this, this, uh, this way of understanding this concept in, uh, in other regards. And here, uh, this is kind of the angry atheist thing. Like for me, when I became, when I decided I didn't believe in God anymore and I had my logical reasons for it, 
I like there are like and most people go through this where they have this angry period where like I fucking know what's right, you fucking idiots, and like there's almost like this angry thing. It's the same kind of idea when you figure out econ- ec- economics. So yeah. and you realize pretty quickly, and then this kind of applies to I think I usually use this in regards like praxis. Uh, you know, like, you know, if I obviously I'm, I'm more of an agorist, it's more what I believe. I understand there are people who still want to work within the political realm. And a lot of like agorists come off as cunty and like, or, or even some of the Hoppians are all just different, all different yeah. types of like people believe in different practices come off cunty. And it's like, it's, it's, you don't serve your ends generally by behaving in that manner. And that's kind of what Konkin's getting at here with once you understand it, like, Hey, like just being the shit out of the people who don't understand it. Like, I mean, maybe it's a little cathartic and maybe it works in some regards. I mean, maybe online, like if you have an audience, I mean, it might be a little bit different, but like on an individual yeah. level, you're not accomplishing anything. Like, yeah, it's, it's, so, it's an every community. I mean, uh, I know people who like, who are doing the Catholic, who join the Catholic church and a month later, they think they're an expert arguments with everybody on Twitter. And I'm like, what are you doing? You don't know anything. I don't know what to yeah. say. I've been here like I'm two months long with you. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's like the people who are the absolute worst at are people who just read Ayn Rand. Yep. People who just went Ayn Rand are the most um, like. If you read Ayn Rand, I ask you how long ago, and if it's like less, less than six months, I don't want to talk to you. Like, it's no point. Yeah. All right. Sec- and once again, I want to say what he's getting into now is like in this kind of agorism in general is like instead of that, like here's how you can apply this knowledge, mm-hmm. which uh, you know that's kind of like to apply to practice. This is kind of my a lot of people's uh, complaints about people who are like involved in like political or just for the messaging aspects like cool mm-hmm. you're telling everybody they're dumb and they don't understand shit mm-hmm. like okay maybe there's some benefit to that here and there but like all right how about we use this knowledge and apply it because yeah. you have it like uh all right second you will discover that the appalling web of state status is controlling or attempting to control control nearly every aspect of human action you will probably feel smothered and and that is not surprising you may also feel like giving up and giving in, but survival alone to take dictates otherwise. Survival, let alone prosperity, demands that you tear through the web of legislation and follow nature's law instead. You must abandon economics to the regulators and the political businessmen who play ball with them. You are left with the alternative. Stifle yourself and starve or embrace counter-economics. Which I kind of like, as I read that, I kind of thought about the, uh, the example used earlier, which like, companies setting their prices where technically you're breaking a law if you set it too high technically you're breaking if you set it even with your competitors technically you're breaking a law if it's too low which is kind of like the whole idea of like you you can't adhere to a legislation so this kind of what he talks about it's like you tear through the web of legislation and follow nature's laws instead which is kind of yeah. the idea like he's not saying throw caution in the wind and don't like at all you know worry about risk mm-hmm. you know it's more just like okay you know n- we need to start applying this 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 apparatus, this this violence, this coercion as a as a risk, and mm-hmm. see it as that. And instead of seeing legal or illegal, we see risk and benefit. Like, yeah. and that's how we see it. So, like, it was a great meme. Uh, someone, uh, some Facebook meme, t- meme group of men, not even a libertarian one, posted a photo of a turkey that was going to be seventy dollars, and they said. Uh, in my area, that it's only a sixty dollar fine for hunting illegally, and I said, "Call it agorism." <laughs> it's just <laughs> come on, do it. It's like mm. anyway, well, I say we our, call it there because I'm yeah, fucking exhausted. We just finished chapter two. We were we were gonna try to shoot for two and three, but uh, two two was a long one. Uh, I do think I, I think now that we've done one and two, that covers a lot of the basics. So we'll mm. get a little more rolling, a little bit more fun conversation. Uh. Um, but these, I do think those are both very, inter- very like chapter one and two, like it's probably like this chapter one and two, probably the most concise, uh, economics lesson. I know everyone, economics, one lesson, this, this is the real economics in one lesson, chapter yeah. one and two of an agorist primer. Uh, and that, that's, they don't even really get into agorist, uh, praxis. So you don't even have to, even if you don't even, because I know everyone's all worried, like, oh, fucking agorism is dumb. I don't want to do agorism, this, that, or whatever. Like, even if you just want a quick economics lesson, mm. Like he's completely adheres in chapter one and two to yeah. basically all of what fucking you know Rothbard's going to everything. It's a summation of all of that chapter one and two. Like fucking what like tops twenty pages. Yeah, and you you basically got all of economics in one lesson pretty much. Um, yeah, um, but so yeah, that's pretty much gonna be it for today. Um, uh, I was kind of hoping we could get a little bit further, but we got, got caught in conversation. Chapter the next chapter will be pretty short, but uh, yeah, 
But yeah, <laughs> next time we won't. Next time, if, Paul, you, you um, you want to start this so late? Like I'm normally in bed by nine. You're like, I start nine thirty. I'm like, dude, I'm asleep by then. I mean, I gotta wait I till the kiddos go to bed, dude. <laughs> I was, I was literally asleep, and I woke up ten minutes before this podcast just to do it. Hey, so, hey, whatever, well, whatever works. Yeah, no, I, I, I pretty much only record after nine. I mean, I'll do yeah. it early if I got to, but I prefer not to impede on time with yeah. the family if I can. I help absolutely it. get that too. Yeah. yeah, so I'm not complaining too much about it because it's like, yeah, oh, no, you're good. Yeah, was, I, I, uh, was I, I went to the lobby like Jacob and a bunch of people were like, we do the podcast. So like, oh, after the kids go to bed, I'm like that's why you all made with kids. I'm, I'm 23 <laughs> over here trying to like, you want a podcast at seven? <laughs> Like no, that's when that's when some kids shows on. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm applying praxis. I'm fucking <laughs> married, you know, shit like that. There you go. Um, yeah. All right, go ahead and drop your plugs if you don't mind. Uh, Twitter is Caleb Brown five four nine. Uh, YouTube is Face Liberty and Praxis. Um, I do podcasts every once in a while. There is no schedule. I do one if I want to do them. Yep. Uh, that's it. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, Real Tank. Uh, I was glad to have you guys. I'm glad some of you guys showed up. Um. Uh, you, I don't know if you realize we've already done this. this is the second one we did. Uh, we did a chat the introduction in chapter one on the last episode. Um, so I actually think it might be my last episode up on my show, like the last numbered episode on my channel. So uh, check that out. I think it's on your channel as well. Um, oh, yeah. we need to get on yeah. that. Oh, you didn't put it up yet? Okay. No, uh, I uh, so, I'm, so I have like five episodes of the backlog. I need to download and upload. So. Oh, you're good. You're good. Uh, all right. For me, uh, this is a No Way Jose show. Uh, I'm, this is uh, I, I'm on the No Way Jose YouTube channel. I'm on all the major podcatchers. I'm on Odyssey as well. If you want to follow me on Twitter, at Galley San Jose. I like money. Give me money. So <laughs> give me money at patreon.com. Just No Way Jose 2020. I listed some of the benefits earlier. Uh, so, you know, if those are things that interest you. I highly suggest at least just get on the $2 level because I, I am soon. I think I'm going to start doing these live streams as only patrons. Because uh, when I first started getting like got monetized, I was kind of chasing super chats, but the super chats die off after a while. There's no point chasing. I'd rather have the the, the efficient, uh, the consistent one. It's also I it kind of clutters my channel when I have these live streams, and then I drop the live streams, and it, it's just I it, like it's more clean just like having a Patreon and then drop it on my channels later. Yeah. Um, Anyways, like, share, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy this. I know these ones will probably get a little less, less views, but uh, I mean, I, I do think this is something some of my patrons were saying they actually enjoyed. So, I mean, I mean, it might be a little more niche audience, but I'm, I'm cool with it. I mean, I'm, I'm not like chasing views or anything. Yeah. I'm more just used as a metric of what people like. But I mean, also, it, I think these yeah. would be more evergreen than anything else. And yes. uh, I looked online, they all know I, I couldn't even find like a uh, YouTube audiobook of counter economics. Like, there's mm. not one available. So, we might be the one if only is one I saw, but it's only two chapters and it's not even yeah. in order. And so we might be the only people actually providing this. So I would make it a good. Lot yeah, of no, I, I already have it set up on my channel. I've only, I've obviously only the one episode yet, but I have it on my YouTube channel. I already have a playlist up. Uh, Cause I mean, anytime I'm doing like some sort of series, which is, this is only the second time I've done it. I did, uh, mm -hmm. I have my anarchist handbook series I'm doing, and this is a series as well. Both of them have playlists. Um, so to make it easier to find, uh, I mean, podcatchers, I don't know how to fucking set up a playlist. I don't know if that's even an option on the podcatchers, but whatever. Um, but yeah, no, uh, I mean, I do think it'll be something that probably does well over time, especially once they were done. It'll be something that adds up. I hope it's a good resource for people. Uh, and, you know, yeah. So, uh, you know, what we said. all right. And with that, yeah, I think we're going to go ahead and cancel or go ahead and kill it. Uh, I appreciate having you on. If you want to shoot the shit for a minute after, you know, stick around after the end of the broadcast. If not, it doesn't hurt my feelings. I don't have any ad to play anymore. Uh, my uh, person that was doing the advertising stopped, decided to stop advertising altogether. So uh, mm. if anyone out there wants uh, someone to do an ad read or whatever, I'm such a, I'm a great ad reader. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, yeah, if you guys, anyone needs that, it's cool. Not whatever. I don't give a shit. All right. I'm out.